Welcome to the podcast, Lauren. Nice to switch roles here and interview you today. Yeah, I'm really excited. I am I am very happy to switch roles. I was just like, oh, relief. I get to show up <laughs> and be asked the questions this time. So yeah, really excited to be here and to see what comes out of us speaking today. <laughs> yeah. So you asked me what my bathroom stall moment was to introduce me. However, I'm just going to get you to roll in with tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Uh, my name is Lauren White and I am someone who values intimacy. And in valuing intimacy, I have always worked in professions where I help and assist people through the dark times in life. So I started off in mental health and then started working in drug and alcohol as a registered nurse. And when I was going through my Saturn return when I was 28, 27, 28, I started Googling other courses and I was like, oh, what am I interested in? What's going to harness what I already know but um, be something different? And I started Googling gender and sexuality courses and Curtin University's sexology program came up and I'd never heard of it before. Didn't know that sexology was an actual thing that people study, but felt this instant knowing that, yes, this is what I'm meant to do. And it was quite fortuitous really because I wrote them an email and at the time you had to physically reside in Perth to do the program. And we just moved to Brisbane about two years before. And I was like, I don't want to move. I don't want to go to Perth. Just moved to Brisbane. And they ended up replying and saying, this is the first year we're going to take um, students who reside in other locations. Would you like to join the program? Yes, I would. <laughs> And I just needed to go over to Perth a couple of times throughout the program to do some um, do some in-house learning and block weeks. And I was more than happy to do that and came out the other side with a graduate diploma of sexology. So I've always um, so I've always wanted to know the most like secret kind of parts of people's lived human experience. I've always been so intensely curious about how people how people live their lives, how they see the world and being being one of the people that walks al- alongside them through their bathroom store moments, you know, the moments that are like the breakdown before the breakthrough. And um, sexology, I practiced as a sexologist for about – maybe about seven or eight years working with women one-on-one mostly to assist them to source their libido for sex, intimacy and life. And during that incredible year that was the year 2020, I got that um, I got that energetic tap on the shoulder and a whispering in my ear, what you once thought empowered you is now imprisoning you and you are no longer a sexologist, you are a confidant. And I listened to that and went and just had so many tears for months about, I have to change, I have to change again. Like or I'd already been through so many um, iterations of myself and the work in being a sexologist and um, when I have to listen to this, I have to listen to this and went through all that nitty-gritty of, changing gears, changing messaging, changing ideal clients, just all, oh, just all of it. it was so awkward, but now I'm in the good bit. <laughs> so it was so worth it. Um, so now the services that I offer, I love working with high generating women. And what I mean by that is they're highly energized. They are devoted to their work and their passion Um, What they've noticed is, though, that um, energetically they are quite in alignment with everything and they're feeling a bit dissatisfied with life, with intimacy, and most of all, with their relationship to themselves. So I help, I walk alongside these women to help them energetically align to what it is that they want, what they desire, maybe what they've been denying themselves, and to make sure 
that they are being more responsive and less reactive in their life so that they can get to those good bits, so that they can get to fulfilment and integration. And I do that through one-to-one and um, luxury events and VIP days. So that is that is me in the work in a nutshell. <laughs> and you're loving it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I am. I love it. I um, I love, and what I love about it is how it calls me to action. It calls me to look in the mirror every single day and say, are you being the thing that you are, that you, that you are proposing to other women? And I can say, yes, I am. Yes, I'm still human. Yes, I'm still, um, I will still make some, you know, errors with my judgment, but I'm always learning and evolving. And my recovery time is a lot quicker than it used to be. Something that used to devastate me and block me for weeks on end is now like an hour of my time. And it's like, all right, and next. So I'm really harnessing my superpowers and, um, and leveling up in so many ways and inviting women to level up as well so that they can so that they can finally be the thing that they want to be and enjoy their lives and feel turned on for their lives instead of feeling like they just have to go through the motions. Mm. Can I ask about the sexologist degree that you did? Mm -hmm. What do you learn? (laughs) It's sexology comes under a public health banner. So I want everyone to take this with a, like a, a nice like grade of salt, it, it, is, it is about looking at, the, at sexual health research. And by sexual health, it doesn't necessarily mean um, transmissible um, diseases and illnesses, but more what does it say about the quality and quantity of what people do um, and what behaviours they engage in sexually. So sexology is the study of human sexuality and um, the people that say yes to that degree either usually fall into one of three streams, which is education, therapy or research. And for me, it was definitely the therapy piece that I was going for. Um, when you, when I went through Curtin's degree, I one thing I really valued, I valued a lot of things in it. One thing I valued was we had a choice. We would we would have like a banner subject or topic for an assignment and then we could choose what we wanted to look at. And I really appreciate that sense of freedom so that we could kind of mould the degree to where it is that we wanted to go. And what it showed me was um, what I thought I wanted to study and learn about. I started off being very interested in paraphilias, which are the um, which are behaviours that within sexuality that um, are deemed to be uh, uh, more niche, sometimes prob- problematic, not always. And I found that very, very interesting. That is so far from what I, when I came out two years later, that is so far from what I ended up being interested in. Yeah. So can you just give us some examples of what paraphilias would be? Yeah. So um, there are some very, very interesting ones. There's um, ones where, and the name has escaped me, but um, there are ones where people are sexually enamored and in a relationship with inanimate objects. Um, So there's the lady that married the Eiffel Tower because that's her partner. There are um, people, usually men or testosterone-based humans that um, marry their car. Uh, (laughs) I think that's called mechophilia. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Those ones were actually really, really interesting because um, you could see these people had they were just, that was, you could see they believed it. They, they actually believed this inanimate object loved them back and they were very sexually aroused by these objects. So that was one of the very, it's very niche, by the way, it's not a common one to the best of our knowledge. Um, But all sorts of, yeah, there are all sorts of paraphilias that are like, um, yeah, these kind of niche, niche behaviors, feet, body parts, um, and some of the more, um, you know, the ones that we know about that are, tend to be more destructive and traumatic to, um, to people in terms of um, children and adolescents. But 
but there were some, yeah, really interesting ones um, in there as well. Mm, that is interesting, for sure. <laughs> okay, and then tell us what else? What else about what you learned there? Um, what is it and how is it that you worked with people who would come to you? What would people come to you for? Yeah. So as a sexologist. I, yeah, when I was working... Um, as a sexologist exclusively I was seeing I've only ever worked with women Um, that's all that got my yes uh, every step of the way I didn't work with couples I just worked with women on their own and for the most part they would contact me and say that they have um, low sexual interest low sexual frequency um, to them that's from their perspective I'm not um, yeah low is very subjective uh they just weren't interested their partner they loved their partners but they just couldn't reconcile being themselves doing all that they do and be sexual as well it felt like there was a block there sometimes um trauma was a part of the their story and what they felt was uh it might have been um They might have been through a process of discussing their trauma in the past um, and they felt like that had been that had been settled to a degree, but now they're finding themselves in this new situation later on where it's like I love this person, I feel safe with them. Why don't I want to have sex with them? Um, And sometimes sexual pain was a part of the reason. Um, in cases like vagin- vaginismus, which is where a woman really struggles to experience penetration because her pelvic floor muscles get locked quite tight. That can apply to tampons as well or going and getting a pap smear. So I, w- I would work quite successfully with those clients actually in helping them to physically, um, emotionally and energetically open up for, for sex. And a lot of that work was centred around them doing things for themselves by themselves well before we bring any partner involvement in so that were the that was the majority of what I was helping women with quite successfully over a number of months and really satisfying work it was really satisfying work Mm. okay so we talked about multiple dark nights of the soul and someone who I just interviewed earlier this morning also referenced the dark night of the soul <laughs> or what you call the bathroom store moment. Mm. So can you take us through where you were and where you are now? Yeah. Bits in between. Um, yeah. So I love talking about dark nights of the soul and bathroom store moments. And to me, the only difference is, well, they're very similar um, processes, but Dark Night of the Soul for me is is literally a night where I don't sleep because I'm just crying and heaving and desperate for relief from this pain that I'm in. So I've had both, <laughs> Bathroom Soul Moments and Dark Nights of the Soul, all, all of which have been the breakdown to the breakthrough. There's always been something incredible on the other side and it's very interesting that I don't trust them. I haven't had one for a long time. If I had one I haven't had one since late December last year, um, but if I had one now, I I would like to think that I'd be a bit more trusting <laughs> based on what life has shown me. But um, yeah, usually uh, what I'm feeling in one of those experiences is intense loneliness. I'm the only person that is going through this thing right now. And I'm not saying that mockingly, but I also am because it's like, it's always the same script. I'm the only person. No one else would ever understand. All these other people have it so much easier. Like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And I can see you smiling. Um, so yeah, there's always, the ingredients are intense loneliness Um, a sense of isolation, a sense of intense sadness, intense grief in some ways. Um, Sometimes there's some regret mixed in with that. Um, There's a sense of inadequacy mixed in. It's a really potent, both bathroom store moments and dark nights of the soul are an incredibly potent cocktail for this is an ending this is the end. How can I possibly get through this? And my bathroom store moment that informed so much of my work was the beginning of 2020 um, before lockdowns happened. And I was just sitting in a restaurant with our friends and just felt like I was behind. 
like I was behind like like we just fucking grow up Lauren like how are you not at this point yet like you sacrifice security to follow your dreams and look at where it's gotten you like it was really like this really berating voice was coming through and a bit of a shame spiral happened so I went to the bathroom for ages and just had this big big cry about it and um came out and then that later on not that day but it later on informed um a secret society that I formed for nine months where we chatted online and we had pseudonyms and we could just talk about whatever we wanted so it's like I have to trust like these things they can be very generative it's like you're in the winter and then the spring comes and something can grow and bloom from bloom from them I've had a lot (laughs) yeah so is there a particular one because you've had many of them a particular one where you can just take us into the story a little bit more? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll take you into the story. There's that one. That one was quite powerful because it really showed me that when I kind of self-destructed, not self-destructed, I didn't hurt myself in any way, but that sense of destruction happening was actually ge- created something else. So that one was quite powerful. My most powerful dark night of the soul was December last year when um, I had a wonderful day with two groups of friends, which really had held a lot of meaning to me because we've been turned around, turned around from seeing our family at Christmas time to get back across our border in Queensland. We literally arrived and then found out that we had to turn around um, after driving 10 um, hours through the night. So um, I was just really done. I was like, we saw these friends, we'd had COVID tests, we were negative, um, great days. And then something just turned dark for me that night. It was like, how could I have such an amazing connected day and then drop? And I think it was, again, maybe a sense of comparison that I'm not at this point, I should be at this point, blah, blah, blah. I think there was something sneaky at play that I hadn't quite cottoned on to. And that night was so bad. I didn't sleep. Um, I cried. I wanted to quit my business. <laughs> so dramatic. Um, I wanted to, like, everything was, is just so dramatic. I have to quit and I'm ashamed. I'm going to go hide. and I'm going to go get this very boring day job and do nothing with my life. And um, all of that was going on. <laughs> and um, it really was, the again, the breakdown before the breakthrough. Uh, sat there the next day. My husband took the kids out, said, I'm going to give you some space. And he did say at one point, is it time to go back to the GP and have a chat about depression and I was like I think it might be so I booked that appointment in and um, after New Year's got into the GP and got back just when I surrender I surrender I have depression I cannot deal with these flare-ups anymore I've done my best over years and years postpartum and essentially my story is high levels of stress ended up triggering off a depressive episode that I wasn't quite an illness that was that I wasn't quite getting on top of when I got back on medication and started working oh my god everything just went into the stratosphere because it was like this is why all the mindset stuff wasn't working this is why all the energy pieces weren't working didn't matter how much I journaled didn't matter how much I heard like about belief and taking a leap and being abundant and it's just like everything just clicked into gear it was like oh here I am and now I actually believe all those things because I'm not constantly fighting off this depressive voice so for me that dark night of the soul I'm really grateful for it because after that I got intensely creative I got really aligned all the energetic work started working rather than me kind of like half believing it and doing this half bait job of everything. So I really want to thank modern medicine for um, being so instrumental in um, me being all the things that I wanted to be. So that was an, that late December dark night of the soul. I'm so grateful for it because it triggered off a whole other chain reaction that I needed in order for everything to actually work. Mm, interesting because some people are so wanting to come off their medication because it feels like it numbs them but it did the opposite for you it helped I guess you were at a crisis point you needed that help um, to bring things up again 
and then you were able to access your creativity. Yep. Mm, yeah. Yep. Incredibly, it was like the lights turned. It was like a new level of lights turned on that just I could not flick that. I could not. I tried everything. I mean, I'm in personal growth. Of course, I've tried everything. Like, <laughs> I've tried everything. And it's just like they just turned on these lights that I couldn't turn on myself. And then everything just went went hyper color and I created the podcast within two weeks of being on medication just when I've got I've got the podcast here it is and like things just and I just yeah just the fear factor went down the creativity and the bravery went up and I feel really sorry for people that don't have that affirming experience on medication or they do feel numb for me it was quite um yeah quite the opposite Mm. Was it something that you tried to avoid going on medication? Yep. Yeah. Yep. I really didn't want to. I really didn't want to for years whenever, whenever I thought about it. There was a stage where I couldn't because I was breastfeeding and the one that works for me was, you know, postpartum second time around. I couldn't go back on it. So I kind of just shelved it after that, shelved it as a possibility. And um all I can say is the moment I booked that appointment, I felt sweets. It's one of the most powerful somatic experiences of surrender I've ever had. I just mm-hmm. felt like, oh, I can. I just felt like I'd fallen <clears throat> into a cloud in every definition. It was like, you don't have to, you don't have to fight this battle and str- you don't have to have the struggle story anymore. So it really... Yeah, it was incredibly powerful for me. And I just went, oh, this is surrender. And this is what I want more of in my life. So, um, it's, yeah, it was very powerful. Mm. Now, I cut you off quite a few minutes ago when you were talking about your sexuality mm-hmm. and coming out. Mm. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. So, um this is actually really beautiful. It's a really beautiful dovetail because it really, I really credit um, the medication as well for everything so much. At, what do I want to say? I really want to credit it for unlocking so much this year for me. <clears throat> I'll always remember 2021 as an intense year of growth and change and being willing to evolve. So I think I had another I had another dark night of the soul. My goodness. I forgot all about it. <laughs> I had another one. I had another one around a really potent moon this year. Can't remember which one it was. And um I was lying in I was lying in bed one night and for some reason I just got the message you know I've known forever that I'm by. I'm like you've known forever don't you think that maybe speaking about this is an important piece of your integration? Don't you think that speaking about this could really liberate other people? Don't you think that it's possible for you to be open about this and that's going to really help you let go like and unveil in a whole other way? I was like, yes. (laughs) My husband was asleep next to me and I think it was 10.30 at night. I was lying there going, should I record a podcast episode? Should I go downstairs and record a podcast episode? Should I just, and I went, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I went down, came downstairs to my office, recorded this podcast episode when I'm not preparing anything. I'm just going to speak off the cuff. And I did that almost in darkness, finished up at 1130 at night and then went, went to bed and thought it's there. It's recorded. I don't have to do anything with it. No one knows that I've done this. And the next morning I mentioned it to my husband and just said, okay, so last night, for some reason, (laughs) I have just decided to record this podcast. I said, but I want your yes before I put it out there, Um, you know, or your support, not your yes, but your support. And he fully supported me. And from then I just went, okay, I know I'm safe. It doesn't matter if anyone rejects me, don't self-reject. You like, doesn't matter what happens with this. If some people in my life don't speak to me again, I'm safe because I'm safe in myself and I'm not going to self-reject. And this is a piece of my self-acceptance. And I just kind of kept repeating that to myself. I went, I know that if these people don't talk to me, I'll still be okay. I'll still be alive. 
And scheduling that podcast gave me a deadline to call my parents. Scheduling that podcast gave me a deadline to leave a voice note to my mentor to say, oh, I love you and I really love your support in this. And the love was unconditional and got bounced back. I was like, oh, and I told some other important people in my life. And it just got me into action. And there were hard calls to make, um, but they went well. And I felt really grateful. And I said to the way I put it to my parents was who were separated. I said, there is no drama. There is no other person. There is no marriage breakdown. I said, there's no nothing. I would rather tell you now than hide all these secrets and this truth about myself. And then one day something happens because who knows what's going to happen in life. I'm not going to pretend I know all the answers or I know exactly how things are going to play out. And I just said, and I don't want you to, I don't want you to find out in a really like inadvertent, secretive, concealed way. And that, that will cause you so much more stress. And if I just say to you right now, Hey, this is me. This has always been me. I would like you to know this truth about me. And I think when I put it in that frame of reference, they like, they understood that it wasn't me coming to them because there's a problem. It's me just letting them know, Hey, this is the truth. Nothing's changing. I'm still married to my husband. I'm still in love with my husband. We are partners. Full stop. So it was, that was a big week. I was pretty drained from that week. Um, And life went on and I got lots of beautiful messages from people who'd listened to the podcast episode and felt like they'd been given a green light to be themselves or to say something to someone that they love about their sexual identity. But um, yeah, I'm really proud of who I am and I'm proud of, um, yeah, really proud of, taking that step and it's just me that's all I can say it's just me this is me yeah how did it feel putting it out there it feels like a relief because I I get to I get to narrate the story I don't care what anyone says about me but and or if they have their own parts of themselves that they haven't reconciled and that this somehow, <clears throat> excuse me, this somehow triggers, not triggers them off, but, um, or somehow activates their projection. So I just feel like if I put it out there, I get to control the story about who I am on a whole other level. And that makes me feel really good. I use that word control sparingly. It's, um, but in this regard, I feel like I get to be, I get to be really clear about what, who I am and what I put out there and nothing, then nothing is a surprise to anyone. And that excites me that, yeah, that I get to show up in that way and I get to feel whole. Like I've probably never felt enough or felt whole until this year. And I finally can go, Mm -hmm. oh, my God, I don't have that. I'm not enough story anymore. I didn't realize how much headspace it took up. I'm so grateful. I literally do not have that story anymore. I just immediately go, as soon as I see something that I get jealous or envious of, I just go, oh, thank you for showing me another way. Sweet. That's possible for me as well. So I just don't have that story and and I would definitely credit being honest about my sexuality as um yeah as being a one of the key parts of that and the fears that ran through your head or the possibilities of well this person might not talk to me or that person might not agree with it did any of that come to fruition no 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 (laughs) but I recognize that that's not everyone that is definitely not everyone's story or experience so I want to acknowledge that if anyone had anything there were sorry there were some concerns through a um, member or two of the family but I feel like I put them to rest and put them to bed kind of thing um and I felt like 
yeah, again, I got to control the narrative when something was said. Um, but otherwise, no, nothing was negative. And if anyone had anything negative, then they didn't tell me in any way. They didn't, they didn't um, mm. write me a message. There was no negativity, you know, um, through, I didn't see any big mass unfollowing or anything like that on social media, although I was open to that. I was like prepared for that um, and open to it because it's like, good, I don't, if this is not, yeah, if this doesn't turn on something inside of you or help you understand yourself on a, on another level or understand me and this work on a whole other level, then I'm okay with that. I'm definitely okay with that. So I feel very grateful that I had that experience and I was very cognizant of saying something without there being a drama or a scandal or, um, yeah, anyone else's involvement mm. or anything like that. So that felt good to do it that what episode, way. Yeah. What episode was it on your podcast? And I'll link you uh, to the, yeah, yeah, the secrets. Um, the secrets of being by, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the episode number. It might be. It's around thirty episode thirty something. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the okay. last one I did of season one, and it was so interesting. After I did that, I felt like oh, I just said, but like I ended season one on that note for the podcast. I was like, oh, I feel done. Like, but, and then I recharged my batteries and got back into it for season two. But it really felt like the final chapter of that first season. It was very interesting. Hmm. So, can you just tell us a little bit more about what you mean? around tuning into what turns you on and how this brings alignment and satisfaction to all that you want in life. Yes. Oh, yes, of course I can. Um, I would love to. So this is really interesting, but I didn't start using the term turn on until I wasn't a sexologist anymore. Well, oh, sorry, I'll, I will always be a sexologist. I'm very proud. I'm a, I'm a qualified sexologist. I will always own that um, part of myself, but I'm not identifying as a sexologist, you know, primary label for me right now. But it's so interesting. It was like I had to finish sexology to really tap into turn on on a whole other level. And I was tapping into it through the work and through my book, Permission, that I wrote three years ago. Um, the word, the term turn on just started coming through and I have to credit, um, Angela Gallo, who I did some business brazen business coaching sessions with in 2020. And Angela is a permission grantor, um, of all sorts. And one of her quotes is, if you're not turning anybody off, then you're not turning anybody on. And that quote just revolves around my mind on a regular basis. It's like, the crux of it being it's safe to turn people off because if you're really palatable, no one's getting, everyone's going, yeah, she's good or she's okay. Or I I like her, but they're not really getting fired up. And I'm here for the getting fired up piece. I'm not here to pander to people and make sure like you like me and all of that. Like I'm not going to let fear lead the way in this work. So Um, I really want to credit Angela for that. Um, And the term turn on just kept coming through. And I started asking myself this very small, powerful question, especially when I started being treated for depression at the beginning of the year. And it was, what turns me on? Does this turn 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 me on? And I was just tuning into that simple yes and simple no. Um, there were no maybes, no room for maybes. It was like it either turns me on or it doesn't. Just starting a podcast turned me on. Yes, it does. That feels so fucking good. I'm going to do it. Um, and I have continued to ask myself this question for everything this year. I will open a menu and ask myself what turns me on. Okay, the oysters turn me on. This turns me on. Getting this turns me on. Um, and it's just been a powerful green light for my life that I would love other people especially women because that's who I work with to access and to ask themselves this question this very simple question of does this turn me on and if one of my caveats is if it doesn't turn you on is it a stepping stone to help you get to the turn on. So we're not going to necessarily feel turned on by absolutely everything we do in our life because there are some tasks and obligations that um, just need to get done. 
So is it, but is it a stepping stone? If you don't love it and it doesn't turn you on, does it somehow get you closer to the turn on piece? Um, And that's just how I'm living my life. I'm letting turn on lead. I ask myself for every offer I do in my work, does this turn me on? Um, And if it turns me on, then that's my yes. And that's my yes to execute. So, um, and I love it. It hasn't let me down. I might not get the, the strategy piece exactly right. That's okay. I'm okay with that because what I trust now is that, it will always show me what it's meant to be if it doesn't work out. Okay, it wasn't meant to, this offer wasn't meant to be, this is actually meant to be this. Oh, thank you. You've turned me on even more than I thought that I could be turned on. So um, you can, I just want everyone to give themselves permission to let something more powerful lead in their lives, something more exciting, like I love excitement. I love and turn on is very excited. It's in that real positive anticipation of what's coming. Um, and I just think there's space for so, so how much. How do you know more. if something how do you know if something turns you on? Like is it do you get a sensation? Do you get butterflies in your tummy? Like I know it's different for everyone, but how does it show up for you? Um, for me, it's goosebumps and I'll get goosebumps, um, in really, it's really, I get them in really specific places. I get them running down my legs when something's really a big yes. Um, I get them for my clients when they're telling me something and I will tell them that is a big yes. Cause I'm getting goosebumps running up and down my legs right now. Um, it's goosebumps. It's tingly pelvis, like almost like arousal and I'm just sitting here rocking in the chair right now. It's, um, it's flushed cheeks. It's feeling my brain expand and morph. It's like my head just goes, whoa, like, <laughs> like it's just expanding as I learn about it. So I was like, yeah, that turns me on. Uh, so it is a whole, it is very somatic. It's very, um, very much there is the alignment of feeling the yes in my heart and some bodily sensations um that go along with that Mm -hmm. so you're now a confidant what does that mean Mm. being a confidant is about walking along alongside someone through all the phases and seasons of their life that that are going to be thrown at them and being that trusted source of guidance that's what a confidant is and uh, the, fe- the feminine version has an E on the end. The masculine version doesn't. So that's why I've got confidant with an E on the end. And I just feel like I keep people's, I keep women's secrets. I always have. When, you know, through sexology, women would sit in the chair across from me when I did in-person sessions and say, I've never told anyone this or no one knows this about my partner and I, um, or you're the second person I've told. I've always been this um, this keeper of secrets and thought, well, why don't I make a title out of it? And what I love about the term confidant is it's so, it's so open to possibilities of what you want to share. It's just got to be your, it's your sharing, whatever that looks like, whenever it shows up for you. And that felt like, it just felt like me and felt like what I've always done and just pinpoint being a little bit more pinpoint um about that as a good as a guide Mm. and what do you think the benefits are of sharing your secrets with someone yeah the main benefit is release which I think is a term and a concept that you work a lot with Jin Uh, I know you do (laughs) you have a program called release the main benefit is release Release, 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 release. And one of the things that my clients say when they first start working with me is I didn't realize that I was carrying around this weight in my chest or this pressure in my chest and in my heart and this anxiety and I'm finally feeling it dissolve. They're just just this sense of heaviness because they're doing everything solo. And they're expecting that their brain can come up with the answers. They're expecting that their brain can come up with the solutions. 
what's really, what's often missing is that somatic piece, is that dropping down into the body piece, is letting the body lead more often where possible. So release is the main thing. Feeling seen and heard is incredibly powerful because that promotes bonding, not just with another person, but within yourself. And that sense of, I mean, I've used these words a lot in this episode, but reconciliation and integration, like finally letting those pieces slot into place rather than having them locked in a box somewhere where they just can't be, they just can't be integrated in any way. And this is bad part of myself, or I did this thing, or I can't believe I'm this way and no one knows it, but we just, we allow that you speak about it. You get that sense of relief. You get that sense of understanding and then it can integrate. And it's not so scary anymore. And then you're not, my clients aren't contorting themselves to wear these very uncomfortable metaphorical masks of I'm capable, I'm fine, I'm independent, I've got this, no one can see beneath the veneer, no one can see beyond the veil, like keeping this kind of hard protective exterior up, which is costing them so much energy and they don't realise until they let it down how much it's actually costing them in terms of intimacy and connection and self-intimacy. So there are so many benefits to releasing and revealing your secrets to this is the asterisk to a safe person who you trust can handle and hold you in that revelation and revealing yeah it's fascinating I bet what you get to hear Mm. yeah it is it is it's it's an honor and a privilege to be invited into someone's world when they haven't let a lot of people in. And what I really love about whether it's the VIP day or it's the one-to-one process that I do with women over six months is you just, just being a witness to that evolution and seeing them self-regulate in a whole new way, seeing them self-soothe, seeing them, interestingly enough, they love control, but they actually get, they realize, oh, I can get control in this whole other more empowered Um, in some ways more certain way by self-regulating, by coming back to me and not being reactive. And it's absolutely fascinating and just an incredible, an incredible honour. I feel so privileged that I have such, um, such amazing clients that keep stepping up to the plate and keep allowing themselves to be seen and vulnerable. It's absolutely, it's mind-blowing. Yeah. Oh, I get it. Just watching the involvement is so cool. It's like, this is where you were and this is where you are now. And imagine where you could go. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So what kind of women do you work with? Like what are some of the issues, their pain points that they would be mulling over, wishing someone could help them with? Yeah. Yeah. So the women that I work with before they sign up or complete an application form, or we have a chat in the, you know, in the DMs about working together, they are feeling like they just can't keep trying to work everything out on their own. They have done that. They've done that to death. It's like, I'm trying to be this, I'm trying to be this more, expansive version of myself this more they won't use the word sovereign sovereign but it is them tapping into their sovereignty I want to be a magnetic woman I look at other people and I wonder how that could be me I want to know what it feels like to walk into a room and be magnetic and have everyone look at me like they're they're sensing they're really picking up on there's this thing that I feel like I'm missing and but I know that I can access it. I just do not get how I access it. So they identify as high achievers, what I call high generators. They've got high energy. They've got high passion. Um, and they are abundant women, but they haven't been that abundant with themselves. Like there's this missing 
there's this missing piece of really allowing themselves to take up more space and be all of themselves and be more expressive. And they're reckon because they've usually listened to the podcast or are getting familiar with my work around turn on and the masks that we wear, they're recognizing, oh, I wear a mask, a metaphorical mask. I wear a mask. Uh, oh my God. And I just, I don't know how to take it off. I have no idea. How, where do I even start with that? So that's where they're at by the time that they come and see me and sign up to work with me. They just know that there's got to be more to them than this. And the work starts pretty early on in helping them step into my three favorite words, which are and both more. And so we talk about and both more and we slip that language in um, very early on. I can feel this and... But da, 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 da. I can do this and I can be this. I can be both. I can choose both. You know, they've lived in this universe of I can only have this or I can have that. I have this or that. It's like, what about both? What about more? Oh, you've got this and you love it. Could it be more? Like just so turn on and both more. We bring those concepts in um, very early on so that they can start to step into that expansion in a whole new way and stop feeling so limited. So um, the language piece is important. I love wordplay. I love it. Love the word piece. Love it. Very, very qualitative person. Very like I'm very um, intuitive and I love the word piece and playing around with words. So that's always a guaranteed part of the process. Hmm. If you're able to, what other sort of things do you notice that you're getting a lot of the women you work with to do or be? And I imagine they're relatively simple things, but not easy for them to implement. Like they've got to learn to do or be this way. Yes. They start to learn to do and be the woman that speaks up they start to learn on, in a whole different way. It's not that they're completely uncomfortable with speaking. It's about speaking in a certain way that allows them to be heard and to be clearer about asking for what they want. And that can be from work situations to what's happening in the bedroom to what's happening with friends and to be more succinct and to really tap into the feelings of it. And I tend to take this for granted, but so many people, um, and myself included, I'm a very, I'm quite, still quite a cerebral person. We're making so many decisions from the head, from the head, from the head. So that one of the things that really changes is less head-based decisions, more heart, pussy, soul, body-based decisions for her. And that's a big step for her. But that piece happens really quite quickly. It's like moving everything from I think to I feel and using feelings as more of the directive rather than should, have to, strategy, um, what would this look like to other people, um, how would this benefit other people, like really, really dropping into them and what they feel and what they would like to do and then seeing the ripples into how that benefits everyone else in their lives in a whole and in their workplaces in a whole other way. So there's some of the really, um, and people, women pick up on that very, very quickly. That's not necessarily a tough nut to crack and it's simple, Um but unless you've got the accountability, it's a challenge. So, so much of what I offer, it's not necessarily the most complicated, complex personal development experiences that you can do. The power of it is in one, immediacy, which is knowing exactly when to introduce that, that thing to a client. The second thing is the accountability piece, following up. Either they just organically follow up with a message or I write, reach out to them. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the third piece is the personalization. So it might be a generic er exercise, but I personalize it for them. So there are three things that you're not going to get unless you've got someone who's really looking into your life and walking alongside you. And there's so much power in that. I know there is for me, and that's what I offer for my clients.
Oh, absolutely. I think so many people try and work it out themselves, but they can get to places, not that it's about getting there fast or being in a rush, but you can get there with so much more grace and ease when you've got someone who's not emotionally attached to your outcome. Yes. Yes, exactly. And you're right. It's not about, it's not about speed, but it just so it expedites the process. Like you just, you get to do that little, you get to do that leap beyond into that territory, beyond what you were probably going to do being like self-enforcing those practices or those new ways of being. Mm-hmm. You talked about being magnetic. <laughs> Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah. A lot of people actually get scared about being magnetic and being looked at when they walk into a room and holding yes. that energy. Yes. So the magnetic woman, first thing is if you want to be magnetic and you are you don't know where to start, the first place to start is to get become more comfortable with receiving. Think about the magnetic woman or picture her in your mind, whatever your own version of the magnetic woman is. And you'll notice she's not desperate. She's not rushing up to like grab opportunities or people or other people's energy. She's not incomplete. She doesn't see herself as incomplete. She feels herself as whole. She is able to trust she is, she might have been there, done that with throwing spaghetti at the wall with her, with her offers or her love life, or I will take anything and, and I don't care what it is, I'll just take it. She might have been there, done that, but now she knows better. And she, she's learned, she's learned a completely different way of being. So the pace that she moves at isn't necessarily really fast because she knows that moving really fast will probably mean that she's operating from a place that isn't necessarily that magnetic. So she needs to really feel into what it is that she wants to project, what it is that she wants to offer and who it is that she's willing to consort with. So it's her energy on every single level. And the way I did a program earlier this year called Just Dance and we danced the dance of magnetism. And the way that I danced or the way that I encouraged women who did the program to dance when I did the dance of magnetism was allowing things to come to you, but then graciously receiving that when it was something that was that is aligned for you to receive. So if you don't get the magnetic woman, then it's most probably because you're in a conditioned giving response and you think... and there's a sense of overcompensation from that, that you need to keep over-serving, over-delivering, making sure everyone's comfortable, give, 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 give. Then someone offers you time or a gift or oral sex or whatever it is, and you shut that down. It's like, no, I couldn't possibly receive. So getting comfortable with receiving compliments, getting comfortable with receiving is a big part of the magnetic energy because people are drawn to give to you. And If it feels good for you to receive that, you don't have to say yes to everything. You can be selective. In fact, I encourage you to be selective and discerning. Um, But getting comfortable with receiving is a big part of magnetism, receiving money, receiving attention, receiving, um, yeah, words, acts of service, all the love languages, touch. And the magnetic woman, it doesn't have to be you 24-7 because there are other archetypes and energies to embody, but she is something that you can activate when you choose to, and it's really powerful when you do. Mm, Interesting. (laughs) Lots of interesting stuff on here. (laughs) I realise I've just said that word interesting many times throughout. So if people want to find out more about you and your work, how can they find you, Lauren? Yeah, Um, you can find me at my website, which is laurenwhite.com.au that has um, all of my podcast episodes, which is called The Secrets Women Keep. It's got all of my services, well, all of my services. I've got two one-to-one services and I am running some events um, at this point in time. 
So go on in, have a look. Um, and I've also got a free opt-in called the 30 days of turn on. If stepping more into your most turned on self is appealing to you, then I not personally deliver, but my email <laughs> management system will deliver 30 days of turn on to you, 30 days of affirmations and an expl explanation with a really, really small action that you can take for 30 days. And it's really fun and beautiful and um, uh, hopefully eye-opening op eye for you. So that's all there on my website. And my social media handles is um, a Lauren White AU or one word. And I'm most active on Instagram, but I do have a Facebook page as well. Brilliant. Is there any last words that you'd like to share with anyone? Yeah. I just want to give you permission to step into becoming the turned on woman and using turn on as more of your guide for this life. And when you do, when you really embrace it, you're going to feel more alive, more fulfilled and more satisfied. And there's nothing more important than that because it flows on to everything and everyone.